Glad you could join us today on Earth Fire. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Whether our homes are near or far from the oceans, our lives depend on them. Oceans supply half the oxygen we breathe and provide food and livelihoods for more than a billion people. They are also home to a wondrous array of wide species, but our oceans are in crisis. What are the problems and what are the way out? Our focus today on Earth Fire. Do stay with us. The oceans, which cover three quarters of the Earth's surface, play a vital role in the global climate system, generating oxygen and absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Today, more than 3.5 billion people depend on the oceans for their primary source of food and an estimated 40 million people worldwide are employed directly by the $21 trillion ocean economy. Every day, our oceans contribute to poverty eradication, promote sustainable livelihoods and employment, as well as improve global food security and human health. They are also the primary regulator of the global climate and a vital sink for greenhouse gases. Despite their importance, oceans, seas and marine resources are increasingly threatened, degraded or destroyed by human activities, reducing their ability to provide crucial ecosystem services. Plastic waste alone kills up to 1 million seabirds, 100,000 sea mammals and countless fish each year. Oceans also absorb about 30% of the carbon dioxide produced by humans but there has been a 26% rise in ocean acidification since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Marine pollution, an overwhelming majority of which comes from land-based sources, is reaching alarming levels, with an average of 13,000 pieces of plastic litter to be found on every square kilometer of ocean. Moreover, death and disease caused by polluted coastal waters costs the global economy some $7.2 billion. Some 30% of the world's fish stocks are overexploited, reaching below the level at which they can produce sustainable yields. We have show, show, showcased the, the impact of all these activities on the marine life. And in, it also comes back to us because our livelihoods are dependent on these marine lives our health is dependent on this marine life. If the ocean that houses these resources that we depend on is not being taken care of, we are actually shooting ourselves in the leg. These are some sayings of crude oil spill on water. The solutions to these problems were the focus of the last regional conference on marine safety and fisheries protection organized by the United Nations Institute for Training and Research in conjunction with the Norwegian Embassy recently in Lagos. The conference looked at environmental issues related to plastic pollution found in the ocean. We need to uh, you know, look at it, one, as a major challenge. It's a major challenge, especially as uh, plastic gets into the sea and you find now that uh, you know uh, fishes are feeding on, on, on plastic you know and of course this is what comes back to our various uh, you know menu and then of course we consume that we have to first and foremostly understand and recognize it as a major food security challenge going forward and of course we have to uh, begin to look at practical you know uh, approach uh, to it we find that we are succeeding in in uh, raising the awareness on this important topic and that uh, st stakeholders and, and uh, par uh, partners in Nigeria are interested in, in, in discussing these topics. Uh, and we are hoping to, to achieve uh, or, or create a platform where people can find each other and, and hopefully develop the cooperation uh, both nationally and regionally because we believe that nobody can solve these issues on their own. And that's also why we engage with other countries uh, to, to strengthen the collaboration in, in the ocean protection. The problems affecting the ocean are bad news for the 3 billion people who rely on fish from marine and inland fisheries, 
as an important part of their diet. And more than 520 million more who rely on fishing-related activities for income and food. What's more, 61% of fish stocks are fully fished. Fishing pressure is close to or at the maximum limit of what can be sustained before overfishing will likely occur. And 29% are overfished, which means they are taken out of the water at biologically unsustainable levels. Less than 4% of the ocean benefits from some kind of protection. The issue of bycatch. Trawling is one of those methods that has a lot of bycatches. But it has bycatches simply because people do not always, I won't say they don't, but they don't always adhere to what the laws and the rules and regulation states. There are minimum sizes, mesh sizes of troll nets that should be used so that the juveniles, the small ones, will not be caught. A lot of, there are a lot of sharp practices that goes on. But in the end, it's, it boomerangs. Because when you take too much of the young ones from the stock, you won't have anything to replace it. So, but education, if we, they are educated, we need to continue this advocacy for them to know the impact. The more we do it, the more people realize the impact and then they'll be forced or they will even come to themselves and realize that they need to do something because it's for the health of all of us. Also, the use of disposable single-use plastic items has effectively turned our oceans into plastic soup. While it is true that not all marine garbage is plastic, current peer-reviewed research clearly indicates that plastic is the dominant material littering the ocean and its proportion consistently varies between 60 and 80 percent of the total garbage in the ocean. And the office for your... Um, um West African Sahara is so interested because the issue of plastic is not just in Nigeria, it's global, um, but uh, specifically, um, you know, Africa, you know, where you have major challenges. We are going to start that uh, pilot uh, project as soon as possible, and we know that uh, it's also a way of engaging youths and those, uh, you know, that can have, uh, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, livelihood in, in the whole uh, value chain of uh, plastic uh, refined, uh, recycling. We need a practical, you know, projects, you know, to uh, make sure that uh, we just don't keep talking about it, but we have to start doing something about it. Nations around the world identified as least developed countries often found across Africa and Asia Pacific, as well as small island developing states, are seen as crucial players in the fight against worsening climate change. Often communities from these regions, particularly shore-based settlements, are the first to suffer the consequences of global warming, which threatens their livelihoods. Now, climate change affects all the activities that we know the maritime sector does, like the port harbors, navigation on sea, bringing in uh, cargoes, even passengers, everything that has to do with shipping climate change affects it. When greenhouse gases are emitted and temperature rises, the sea surge, like we witnessed along the Lake Ekwe axis, it affects the waters. And when this water, the sea surges, it affects the ports. Now, business activities might be disrupted if the sea ports are not actually raised to the level that can really, really combat the effect of the sea surges. Aside that, the aqua life, the aquatic life under the ocean is affected because greenhouse gases affect all the coral reefs, everything, the fishes, the little, little mollusks and all of them, they are affected. That's why we spoke about the need for the maritime sector to really, really do something about greenhouse gas emissions. They should start finding a way to devise a framework to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases from all their activities. If it means making the ship owners pay, if it means making them to use new technology, if it means making them to check their fuel efficiency. Today, shipping is the only industry not included in the 2015 Paris Agreement due to its global nature and the difficulty in allocating emissions from a ship to a single state.
The sector isn't completely unsupervised, however. The International Maritime Organization, a specialized agency of the United Nations, is recognized as the main regulatory body of the industry and has been praised for its efforts in curbing pollution so far. Measurement, reporting and verification, which is a condition every country must have for you to implement your NDC, a nationally determined contribution. In that MRV, three things are involved, okay? One is the greenhouse gas. Everybody's talking about greenhouse gas, the volume of pollution that has been in the maritime sector, right? all the sectors, all right? We will gather them, we got to know them. Then you also develop your NAMA strategy, your nationally appropriate mitigation action, intervention projects, these projects that we use to address these climate issues or you know this this challenge, these externalities, and the third one, once you have done your NAMA strategies correctly, you get the third aspect, which is the support. By regulation, every effluent from the ship, every trash from the ship, is managed and monitored. Um, for instance, we don't pump oil overboard, say dirty oil. There are dirty oil tanks where you are supposed to transfer all your dirty oil into. And when you come to port, the relevant authorities like the environmental authorities come to take this oil out of you. Okay? And those authorities are such that the, you can track where they eventually uh, take that oil to or that waste oil to. Now, in the case of trash, we are, uh, we are, we, we are mandated to collect things like plastics, cans, and other non-degradable uh, uh, wastes and keep them when you can come to port, then they are taken away from you. Now, to avoid unscrupulous elements pumping, say, dirty oil over port, we have what they call dirty oil separators, where you can actually run this dirty oil through the separators. It separates clean water, okay, which goes overboard from the dirty oil which goes into a dirty oil tank. But with no tangible target going forward, critics accuse the International Maritime Organization of lacking urgency and generally moving too slowly on the issue. Meanwhile, the third International Maritime Organization Greenhouse Gas Study estimates that for the period between 2007 and 2012, on average, shipping accounted for approximately 2.7% of annual global carbon dioxide emission. The international shipping has become very, very large. And it will continue to be large. You hopefully, as we are going green, a lot of things, most of these uh, the cars on roads will be off. And a lot of ships will have to come in, moving goods from country to country. There has been a continuous increase in the rate at which we fuel, uh, fossil fuel are injecting carbon dioxide equivalent into the atmosphere. By August 13, 2016, the world exceeded over 400 parts per million, you know, that is for every million molecules of air, we exceeded over 400 in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent, which was really raising the temperature to a level that, you know, everything was coming. We are nearly moving to a point that if care is not taken, we continue to really move the whole world into another thing. Shipping carbon dioxide emissions already increased by approximately 70% since 1990. Under a business as usual scenario, if other sectors of the economy reduce emissions to keep global temperature increases below 2 degrees Celsius, shipping could represent a whopping 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The International Maritime Organization in July 2011 approved the Energy Efficiency Design Index. This is the first globally binding climate change standard. The index applied to 180 countries and entered into force on the 1st of January 2013. The Energy Efficiency Design Index requires new ships to become more energy efficient with standards that will be made increasingly more stringent over time. The coastal zone has the most nutrients of all marine environments. 
sunlight can penetrate the shallow waters above continental shelf, which means that plants can grow while the sea floor provides an anchor for many organisms. As a result, a number of extremely productive and complex coastal ecosystems have evolved. According to the scientific consensus of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the speed at which these changes are occurring has no parallel in at least the last 65 million years. Changes have been observed in almost every part of the ocean, with marine wildlife relocating to higher latitudes consistent with warming trends. Changes in ocean temperature are also altering the timing of key life history events such as plankton blooms and the spawning and migratory behavior of turtles, fish and invertebrates. Talking about ocean acidification, the effect that it has on the resources, on like, like the shellfish, it harms their ability to, to build shells. Because when the, the water becomes acidic, then definitely the material that they use to build the shells are, will no longer be there. So it affects them. Meanwhile, we are depending on these shellfishes for food. We are depending on them for economic purposes, for our livelihood. So if we do the right thing, maybe by reducing, um, by reducing fossil fuel, combustion, reducing the quantity of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, that now sinks into the, uh, into the Atlantic Ocean or into our, well, our own is Atlantic Ocean, that sinks into our ocean, that becomes the uh, carbonic acid that harms these um, animals. We can say that it starts from somewhere. So if we can stop that or reduce our fossil fuel Prints, our gas prints, the, 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 the way at, at rate at which we allow the, these um, gases to go into the air that also finds its way into the waters. It's, it's a, that's the steps we can take as individuals. An expert once said an observation looking down from space would probably believe that an invasion of Africa is being prepared in the Gulf of Guinea. The waters are full of ships. What is going on, however, is not a military exercise, they say, but a destructive race for resources. Two sectors are involved. Some high-tech vessels serve the oil industry and its offshore rigs, while giant trawlers and masses of small artisanal boats are involved in fishing. Both industries depend on resources fossil resources and biological resources respectively. The Gulf of Guinea actually, as you said, is a grand of uh, problems when it comes to the coastal related activities uh, because it's the region in the world where there is a lot of wealth, particularly mining, uh, oil and gas, tourism, fisheries, and etc. Uh, the problem is coming from the fact that you know, after the independence, countries focused only on the exploitation, non-sustainable exploitation of those resources without you know, considering you know, the ecosystem approach or the fight against pollution, you know, how those resources you know, can be depleted and not being able to offer uh, the benefits and services that they were going to provide to the population in the coastal economies. So this is mainly uh, the... Um, non-appropriate planning and governance actually uh, uh, mechanisms that we didn't have you know in the 60s which are affecting us right now west africa waters are estimated to have the highest levels of illegal unauthorized and unregulated fishing in the world representing up to 37 percent of the region's catch in addition to economic losses pirate fishing in west africa severely compromises the food security and livelihoods of coastal communities. In order to resolve this problem, the Monitoring for Environment and Security in Africa, also known as MESA, was launched. We have succeeded in, one, arresting vessels that were in our waters in 2017-2018 that were there illegally fishing, we got them arrested from the intelligence information from the sub-region. 
because the sub-region has created these countries into a task force so that we, we share information, intelligence gathering together and all that. And we also share our list of fishing licenses. So that if a, if, if a vessel leaves Nigeria and goes to Liberia to trawl, they will check if that vessel is legally lawful to be in their waters from the list that we share with them. So it has really helped a great deal. And because of the collaboration, we've been able to um, have IMO on, our, on our, all our fishing vessels. We now have automatic identification system on all, all our vessels. We're now beginning to have transponders on our fishing vessels so that we, the officers, can view the vessels at sea to ensure that they are compliant. The Abidjan Convention is a regional convention administered by the United Nations Environment Programme that addresses pollution, overfishing, dumping at sea, exploration of the seabed and other activities that can affect the health of marine and coastal ecosystems in Africa. The Abidjan Convention was uh, signed in the 80s and entered into force in 1984. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it came up you know, as a multilateral or regional uh, legal agreement you know, without the uh, uh, enforcement mechanisms. Enforcement mechanisms is how the um, provisions of the Abidjan Convention as a legally binding instrument you know, could be domesticated in the national legislations. This has not been the case, but right now you know, we are working on that you know, to come to the parliament in countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, all the 22 countries from Mauritania all the way down to Africa, uh, to South Africa, to have like the proper uh, legal mechanisms, you know, so that the coast and the oceans are protected, you know, so that they can continue to providing the um, ecosystem benefits and services to not only the populations but also to the economy of the of the whole countries. Parties also agreed to work more closely on coastal erosion and marine protected areas, including through the development of a marine protected areas protocol to assist in implementing Articles 10 and 11 of the Convention. Articles 10 and 11 require parties to take all appropriate measures to prevent, reduce, combat and control coastal erosion and to endeavour to establish marine parks and reserves to protect fragile ecosystems. Rather than coming you know, with only text, you know, convention text, uh, and say, yeah, this is going to change the world. Yeah, it's not going to change the world. We need to do several things. First of all, you know, we need to have those provisions you know, in the convention, domesticated national uh, legislation. We need to have implementation and enforcement mechanisms. And more importantly, we need to put money. If we want to preserve the cost of the nation, you have no idea how much the economic value of the Lagos Lagoon, it means a lot in terms of fisheries, in terms of tourism, in terms of energy production, in terms of just landscape, the beauty, the beauty of it. In developed countries, I would say civilized countries, the most beautiful houses are built along the shores of the lagoon. You go to Geneva, Lake Le Mans, you know, you can't afford you know, buying one square meter of land there. In London, I think they have the tunnels. In Paris, they have the same. You know, all civilized capital, you know, those places are among the most in, uh, uh, expensive lands. But what are we doing with ours? We defecate. We have no land-based sources, pollutants, you know, and everything. So we need to switch. We need to rethink and see how we can apply the blue economic principles in our economies and how we can change this crisis in the governance and other adjacent waters related uh, 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 governance into an opportunity. The oceans are a vast resource which contributes to human well-being. Therefore, it is without a doubt in the best interest of humanity to ensure that the oceans are exploited in a manner that is protective and sustainable in order to preserve their health and guarantee their continuing viability. That's all we have for you today. Do join us next week for a fresh episode. In the meantime, you can view this and other edition by visiting our website, chinastv.com. Do click on the playlist.